Guys, there's a flow of thought that I've actually gone with this weekend. I'm excited to speak to you. It's not common that you get something like 80 plus young men together to be able to speak to them truth. So this is amazing. And it's an amazing opportunity for me. It's one that overwhelms me. It's one that terrifies me because every word I say as a preacher, I'm going to be held accountable for before God in judgment. And so I'm excited to be here. I've wanted to share truth. And so what I did was I made a bit of a progression of thought. If you notice, last night, I began with the gospel, right? You cannot act like Christ if you do not have a relationship with Christ. It's impossible. If you try, you know what you become? It begins with an H, hypocrite. You become a person who tries to be good on the outside, but inside, as Jesus said, you're full of dead men's bones. It's a hypocrite. You've got to know this Christ with an experiential knowledge. You've got to love him and have a relationship with him before you have any opportunity to become like him. That was last night. This afternoon, I said, okay, for those of you who know Christ, and my prayer is that every single one of you would know Christ or come to know Christ, what is going to be the foundation of becoming like Christ? The Word of God. The Word of God. It's got to be more important to you than your daily food. Why? Because the Word of God is the channel through which the Holy Spirit of God flows into you and produces the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience. Kindness, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control. That's the foundation, the Word of God. Now tonight, I want to address you as men who now are you, you're, you've begun the journey of Christ. You're building upon the foundation. How do we build on the foundation of God's Word? What should your mindset be? What should your goal be as a young man who knows Christ, who's in His Word? Where should your... What should be the mindset? What should be the course your life begins to take? And so that's what I want to do tonight. God uses young people. You guys are young. God uses young people. You know that, right? Joseph was a teenager. Remember Joseph in the Old Testament? He was thrown into the pit by his brothers. He was sold into slavery in Egypt. And what happened with Joseph? He rose to power. He's a man who resisted temptation. You remember him and Potiphar's wife? How could I do this sin against God? He ran from the adulterous woman. And he's a man which the nation of Israel, Abraham was promised that his descendants would be more than the stars in the sky. And Israel, the nation of Israel, in its small little form in Joseph's time, was going to go extinct because of a famine. But God chose Joseph to be the means through which his whole people would be saved. He was a young man. Moses, as a young man, now get this, guys. Maybe you've overlooked this about Moses' life. Moses was going to be the next pharaoh in Egypt. He was a young guy. He had at his fingertips, at his disposal, absolute royalty. He would never worry about money again. He would have as many women as he wanted to. He'd have the nicest meals in the land. He would be top dog in the most powerful empire on earth. And as a young man, he chose rather to suffer with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. As a young man. And you know what Moses did, right? He led a whole nation out of Egypt. He led a whole nation for 40 years in the wilderness, taking them to the promised land. A young man. Think of Samuel. I'll talk about Samuel a little later. A mighty prophet of God. He was called as a young man. The Lord soon, maybe, uh, I don't know his exact age, but the Holy Spirit came upon Samuel and he began to prophesy and he was mightily used by God. Think of David, King David. Remember David? Took down King Go- or, uh, uh, Goliath from the Philistines. And he was one of the mighty kings of Israel, man after God's own heart. He was a young man. Solomon, a young man. Josiah, you might not know this about Josiah. Listen to 2 Kings 22, verse 1. Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign as king. Is anybody here eight years old? You better be loud if you are. No, 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 not inside, but actually physically, literally eight years old. 
Not act like an eight-year-old. Put your hands down. I mean, an actual eight-year-old. No? Okay. Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 31 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jedidah, the daughter of Adadiah, Bozkoth, and he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and walked in all the way of David, his father, and he did not turn aside to the right or to the left. Gentlemen, God uses young people for his kingdom purposes. But Satan does too. Remember I spoke earlier about those who are wreaking havoc in our world today? It's a lot of young people, isn't it? Young men, I want you to know that just because you are young, you are not useless in God's service. In fact, you are strong, as we discussed earlier, not your biceps per se, but your determination of will. You have energy, passion, vigor, strength, stamina, determination, discipline. And my question tonight is how are you going to use your youth? These vital years of your youth, how are you going to use these days and months, years? Will you waste them? Or will you use them for the kingdom purposes of God? Will you be an honorable vessel or a dishonorable vessel? In 2 Timothy 2, we read this. Now, in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honorable use, some for dishonorable use. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful. Think of that word, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. My question that I'm posing to you tonight is, will you be useful to the master of the house? Will you be useful to the king of the universe, God himself, in his service? Or will you sit on the sideline of this cosmic spiritual warfare that is happening in the heavenly places and watch as others run the race, others fight the fight, others do the work, as you sit on the sideline? And allow others to be used in the Lord's service. Guys, I want you to know something. There are only two kingdoms in this world. Actually, do you have this other text up there? Go to the next slide. In this context, he says, So flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. The point there is this. Those vessels fit for use that he just talked about. A vessel. Think of a, you know, we maybe not use that word so much. You think of a vessel. A vessel is an object that you use for an intended purpose, okay? So a bowl is a vessel used to serve food, right? That's what a vessel is. So there are some vessels that are used for honorable purposes. They serve a really good purpose. Others are just kind of, you know, the vessel that you put out to the dogs and you throw, you know, the refuse in there and the, that it's just a vessel for nasty stuff. And he's saying, which vessel are you going to be? And then notice this, as he's talking about vessels and usefulness, he says, flee youthful passions. So he's not speaking to the old fogies. He's not speaking of grandpa who finally gets his life together and says, okay, I've lived a good 50 years. Let me now do something for God. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking to you. He's saying, do you want to be useful? Do you want to be used by God? Flee youthful passions. He's talking to young men. God uses young people. And I want you to know something, gentlemen. There are two kingdoms in this world. God's kingdom and Satan's kingdom. That's it. There's no middle ground. There's no neutral kingdom. There's no, I haven't decided yet kingdom. There's not. You're either in Christ's kingdom or you are in Satan's kingdom. Don't believe me. Believe Jesus Christ. He said in John 8, speaking to those who rejected him, he said, you are of your father, the devil. And your father's desire, your father is a liar from the beginning, and your desires are to do your father's desires. There are two kingdoms, that's four, there are two kingdoms in this world, God's and Satan's. And you're in one of the other, one or the other. In fact, we're told in Genesis 3.15 this. This is the very first mention of the gospel in the Bible. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, 
I will put enmity between you and the woman, God said to the serpent, between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head. You shall bruise his heel. That's the reality of the world. God talking to the devil says there's going to be enmity between your kingdom and mine. And that's how it's been ever since, isn't there? There's enmity between the devil and Jesus. We looked at that in Luke 4, remember? The devil tempting Jesus. There's enmity. There's a warfare there. There is enmity between those in Satan's kingdom and those who follow Christ in God's kingdom. There's a warfare. There's a persecution. That's why you feel it, some of you young men who have taken a stand in school for Christ, and you feel the backlash, don't you? There's enmity. Because you're in God's kingdom, they're in Satan's kingdom. Let's go to Ephesians 6. I told you earlier we would, so let's go there. Ephesians chapter 6, beginning of verse 10. These are familiar verses, or should be, I, I trust, to, to many of you. Ephesians 6, verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Let's pause there. My point is this. There are two kingdoms in this world and they are at odds with one another. They are at war with one another. And if you're not in Christ's kingdom, you are in Satan's kingdom, which means you're not a neutral soldier. Ah, well, I don't really touch Christ. I don't really go there. I'm just hanging out doing my own thing. No, you are actively in service to someone. That's what last night was about. Who are you going to serve? Come to know Christ. Enter the kingdom of God. But for you men who are in Christ's kingdom tonight, I want you to know this, that you are engaged in a spiritual warfare. You're actively engaged in a cosmic battle of spiritual proportions with demons and angels and forces over this present darkness. You realize this, don't you? This is not a material world. This is a reference too old for some of you guys, but there's a song, Material Girl, I think by some pop star in the 80s. And this is not a material world only. The world wants you to think that. Oh, what you see is all there is. No. This is a spiritual wor world. And we are engaged in a spiritual conflict with the present powers of darkness. And so, I say that to say this, that you, young man, tonight have a decision to make. You have a decision to make that you're going to make before you leave this room. Now, you might think, ah, I'll think about it. Putting off the decision is a decision itself. It's an answer to the, to the question I'm going to give you. You have, every single one of you, a decision to make as you sit in this chair and listen to my words. It is this. Will you, Christian young man, be available for the master of the house for good, honorable use in his kingdom or not? Will you be a vessel for honorable use or not? And putting off the question, putting off the answer, is an answer. In the negative, no, I will not. Give me more time for my pleasures and my delights before I serve my king. Will you be available in this spiritual warfare or will you sit on the shelf? Turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. Guys, as you're turning there, I want you to know that this is a flagship chapter for young men. You guys, when you plop open your Bible, it should go to 1 Timothy 4. You guys should know this chapter. You should know the flow of thought. You should know the arguments. You should know the doctrine that's laid down by the Apostle Paul. You guys, you who love Christ, I'm telling you, get to know 1 Timothy 4. It's awesome. You know what's amazing? If the Apostle Paul showed up, you know what I would do right now? I would sit down and say, let him preach, right? The Apostle Paul, one of the most mighty men to ever walk the face of the earth, barring our Lord Jesus Christ. And he writes 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus to young men. 
Get to know them. It's exciting. It's great to see what the Apostle Paul shares. And 1 Timothy 4 specifically is a powerful chapter. I'm going to turn there myself. One that we ought to be familiar with. One that we ought to readily go to. And I want to walk through it briefly with you here. Um, We don't have time, uh, so I have to be selective here. We don't have time for everything. But in beginning in verse 1, notice this. I want you guys to catch this. This is important. Now, the Spirit expressly says that in later times, some will depart from the faith. Some are going to leave. Now, notice why. By devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and the teachings of demons. Whoa. Right? Whoa. (laughs) The, the, The teachings of demons. What do you think of when you think of the teachings of demons? You probably think of someone painted in black, bowing down with the 666. Kind of a scary figure, right? If a man got up on this stage and began to teach demonic doctrine, you think you guys would be able to recognize it? Maybe not. Look at this. Look what he says. He, he defines it. Watch this. They'll depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and the teachings of demons through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared. Now, listen to the demonic doctrine. Listen. Who forbid marriage and require abstinence from foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. My point here, I've got to move on quickly, but my point here is this. The demonic doctrines are not, hey, we're going to sacrifice this animal. Let's slit its throat. That's not it. It's not scary. It's not ooh and ah. You know what it is? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Come to Jesus. Believe in Jesus. Yeah, put your faith in him. Oh, by the way, but if you're going to be truly saved, you can't eat pork. And he says it's demonic. They're adding to the gospel. They're removing the glory of Christ. They're adding works to a salvation by faith. And he says it's demonic. And so he's speaking to a young man and he's saying, Timothy, men are going to leave the faith because of these teachings. So what are you supposed to do, Timothy? Watch this. Verse 6. If you put these things before the brothers, he just said, good doctrine. If he tells them you should receive everything with thanksgiving, you've got to teach these things, good truth, before the brothers, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, being trained in the words of the faith and of the good doctrine that you followed. Notice that. He says, Timothy, if you're going to be a man who saves the souls of others, you better know the truth. That was our, that was our session earlier, right? Got to know the word. You've got to know when you hear that demonic doctrine, wait a second, the Bible says the opposite. If you don't read your Bible, you're not going to know that. Timothy, be a man of the word, he's saying. Now look at this. Guys, this is going to get immensely practical and remarkably uncomfortable in about three, two, One. Ready? Verse 7. Have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. Rather, train yourself for godliness. I'm kidding about the uncomfortability. But what I mean is this. He's saying, young men, stop being silly. Stop it. Stop being childish. Stop being foolish. Have nothing to do with silliness and myths. But train yourself for godliness. This is the language of an Olympic athlete. Who wants to be a professional athlete? Great. Here's your game plan, guys. You ready? I'm going to tell you. I don't even need to know your sport. I'm going to give you the game plan. This is how you're going to become a professional athlete. And I was a professional athlete. So I'm going to tell you. You ready? Are you taking notes? Where are your notes? Watch as much daytime television as you can. Watch as much daytime television. Do you guys... Do you guys like Doritos? Eat Doritos. Soda. Who likes soda? Eat as much soda and carbonated drinks and high fructose corn syrup. Guys, eat it. And wait, wait, wait. Here's the last tip. So I want you to listen. I want you to listen. Do as little physical activity and training for that sport as possible. It's false, right? You're going to get nowhere, right? Everybody knows that if you're going to be a professional athlete, you've got to set your eyes on the target. You've got to set your eyes on the target and you've got to give up some things you love. 
You've got to train hard. Guys, at 13 years old, I woke up at 5.30 in the morning, whether it was raining, snowing, or hot, and I trained for an hour and a half doing technique for my sport. Training, training, training. You have to give up going to the parties because I've got to train in the morning. I've got to give up eating that junk food because I've got to watch my body. I train and I focus and I, right? That's how you accomplish that goal. And what Paul is saying here is this. Guys, are you going to be useful in the kingdom of God? Then get rid of silliness and train yourself for godliness what he's saying now watch this i gotta go on i wish i had more time verse eight for while bodily training is of some value godliness is of value in every way as it holds promise for the present life and also the life to come the saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance now listen to these words for to this end we toil and strive because we have set our hope on the living god who is the savior of all people, especially those who believe, toil and strive. Who here can say, I toil and strive in my life of holiness? I toil and strive to know Christ with an intimacy that I've never had. I toil and struggle to write God's word on my heart, although it's so much easier to wake up and barely put on a sweatshirt and go to school. I'm going to toil and I'm going to struggle. I'm going to wake up, I'm going to read my Bible, and I'm going to pray because I want to know Christ. I'm striving for the living God. Can you say that? Or do you toil and strive for the things of this world? Video games, movies, memorizing every line from the latest comedy, the sport. Now, not all those things are innately bad. It's video, some video games aren't bad, right? Some movies aren't bad. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying, where's your energy? Paul, writing to a young man, says, stop being silly and train yourself for godliness. Remember, it's this question I'm asking you. Remember, this is ringing through your head. You have a decision to make. Will I be useful or not? Yes or no? So, as I tell you this, you might sit there and say, no, 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 I want my silliness, so I'm going to stick with that. Okay, decision made. Decision made. But if you say, no, I want to be a Solomon. I want to be a King David. I want to be a Josiah. I want to be a Samuel. I want to be a Joseph. Well, then this is the decision you make. I'm going to do away with silliness, and I'm going to be a man. I'm not going to be a 22-year-old man who's eating chips and saying, Ma, make me a sandwich as you play the great, latest and greatest game. No, I'm going to be a man who trains myself for the purpose of godliness. Now, I'm getting to a climax here, and we'll see it. Watch this. In verse 11, he tells Timothy, command and teach these things. Now, this is our verse. Let no one despise you for your youth, but set for the believers an example in speech in conduct, in love, in faith, and purity. <clears throat> Guys, here it is. Notice what he said. Let no one despise you. So, this is what I want you to do tomorrow. I want you to go up to every adult. I want you to grab them by the shirt collar and say, Mr. Bob, don't despise me. I'm not going to let you. You think that's what Timothy's saying to do? No, stop it. He's not. This is what he's saying. He's not saying you, don't, you go up to every adult and say, you, hey, hey, you, are you despising me? Huh? I might be young, but hey, are you despising me? It's not what he's saying. He's saying this. By your life, don't let them despise you. Here, I'll give you an example, okay? Sports field. Again, me. I went to college. The reason I chose my college was for the athletic program. Because again, I wanted to be a professional athlete. So I chose, I went to Hartwick College. I went to Syracuse University as well. When, you, when I went to college, I was there, I was going to be the starting goalkeeper. I wasn't. There was a guy ahead of me, and guess what? He was only one year ahead of me, which meant for me, uh-oh, the next three years of my collegiate career, I might be on the bench. That distraught me. That means no professional for me. You don't have one year to show the scouts what you can do. So I was distraught. Long story short, met with my coach and everything. He, he, he instilled something in me. This is what it was. I determined that I was not going to let the coach keep me off the field. No, I didn't threaten his mother. No, I didn't 
grab him by the shirt collar. You know what I did? First to every practice, last to leave. The hardest working person I knew. I determined to be the hardest working person I knew. What was I doing? I was saying, okay, coach, I'm not going to let you choose anyone else by my actions. You're going to say, man, this guy's been the starter, but look at Jeremy. We can't keep him off the field. Do you, are you guys following me? That's how you don't let them despise you by your life. You don't go up there and grab him by the shirt collar and say, don't you despise me. And notice what he says. Let no one despise you for your youth, but rather set for them an example. What he's saying is this, people are going to look at you and go, oh, he's just a 15-year-old. Oh, he's just a 12-year-old clown. Oh, he's just a 9-year-old kid. He doesn't know anything. He's saying, don't let them say that. Why? Because of how you live, people will look at you and go, you know, he's only 15, but I want to talk like he talks. And he's only 10, but I wish I had the faith of Eric at 10 years old. And He's, he's only 11 years old, but look at the way he loves others. And they don't despise you because of your life. Are you guys with me? He's talking to young men. He's not talking to the old preacher. He's talking to you. And notice this. Guys, I want to go through what he says. Set for the believers an example in speech. You and I, in this culture, have come to believe a lie about our speech. I'll get to that in a moment. But remember I said Samuel, right? 1 Samuel 3.19, listen to this. And Samuel grew, he was a young man, and the Lord was with him, and let none of his words fall to the ground. Think about that. God was with Samuel, so none of the words he spoke just fell flat. That means nothing was meaningless. It wasn't vain. How many words do you speak in a day that if you were to write it down, you'd say, oh, that's garbage, that's garbage, that's garbage right? Just foolish talk. Foolishness. It's just, nothing. it's just nothing. Samuel, as a young man, God was with him and let none of his words fall to the ground, which means his words hit their target. They hit their target. They weren't wasted breaths. And he's a young man. I look at that verse. I say, oh God, please don't let my words fall to the ground. Don't let them come off of this pulpit and just hit there. Let them hit their target. Next text. I think you've got it up here, right? Yeah, Psalm 12. The words of the Lord are pure words, like silver refined in a furnace on the ground, purified seven times. That's the way you purify silver. You have this metal, and it's got all this dirt in it, right? So they heat it up to the point it melts. The dirt comes to the top. The person scrapes off the dirt, lets it dry. And then they heat, once it's dry, they heat it again to the point it melts and more dirt comes to the top. They scrape it off. They do that seven times. So a ring, if you have a silver ring or something, it's been purified seven times. There's not pieces of dirt in there. It's perfectly pure. And he's saying the words of God are refined perfectly. They are pure. They're pure words. So you know what standard that is for us? We're not loose with our tongue. Oh, well, I didn't technically curse because I put an I instead of a U. You know, I didn't technically curse because I put an, an R instead of an M. And so it's not technically a curse word. It's just darn. And it's just, you know, heck instead of, I'm not technically cursing. Is that striving for purity in your words? Is that striving for refinement? Is that striving for the words of God? Listen, guys, remember I said it from Luke 4? We live by the words of God. What if God's words were infectious? Or infected, I should say. What if God's words were, were polluted? What would happen to us who are living off of them? God's words are pure. Now notice this, Psalm 19. And you say, well, that's, God, that's God's word, right? I'm not God, I'm just a guy. Listen to Psalm 19, verse 14. This is a prayer. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Well, what kind of words do you think are acceptable in God's sight? Pure words, right? I mean, if God speaks pure words, he wants pure words. So the psalmist is praying, let my words be like your words, O God. You guys following me? Now watch this. Here's the lie we've come to believe. That words are neutral. 
Neutrality is neither here nor there, right? If something's neutral, you say, well, it's neither bad nor good. It's just neutral. It doesn't help me or hurt me. It's just neutral. I'm going to tell you something right now. Every single word you ever speak, every single word you ever hear is doing something. It's not neutral. And here's what it's doing. Ephesians chapter 4. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. Two categories for every word that ever comes out of your mouth. It either tears down or it builds up. It either pulls down the hearer or it gives them grace. Ever. Ever, Every song you ever listen to, it's either pulling you down or it's lifting you up. We fall into this idea of, oh yeah, I listen to this music and you know, it doesn't really have a bad effect on me. Yeah, he's talking about women and drugs and gangs and, and this and that. But it's, I mean, it's just, ah, it's just my spare time. I'm kind of zoned out. No, it's a lie. Every word you ever listen to, every word you speak is either tearing you down or lifting you up. And what Paul is saying to Timothy is, Timothy, in your words, be an example for every Christian. That means tomorrow when you walk into church and you see a 75-year-old woman who you literally have absolutely negative in common with, not just nothing, but like negative in common with, like the only thing you have in common with this woman is the fact that you're both homo sapiens. When you see her, that means humans, when you see her, Timothy is saying you should set an example for her on how to talk, on how you talk. Whoa, have you guys thought about that before? I want to get you guys, by this, I want to kind of shake you a little bit and get you out of this idea that you're just a, 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 a teen something. Oh, well, I'm just a, a, I'm just a teen, so this is just how we act. So, uh, yeah, I can be kind of immature until I'm 25 and I hit the real world. I want to get you out of that mold. Because remember, we have this decision to make, will I be useful or not? Those guys who think, well, I'm just 13, so I'm just going to act like a 13-year-old, not going to be useful. But those guys who say, you know what? I'm going to set for the believers an example in how I talk and live. Those are the vessels that when God says, okay, I've got something I've got to accomplish. Who can I use? And he goes to the shelf and he says, here's Thomas. I can use Thomas. And here's here's Niall. I can use Niall. And here's Eric. And great, I'll grab Ethan off the shelf. These guys will be perfect for this. I can use them for the kingdom. And then there's going to be guys who goes, there's, oh, no, 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 <laughs> uh, no, can't, okay, can't use him, can't use him, oh, there's one. Which are you going to be? Well, Paul says, set the believers an example. Get out of this mindset that I'm just a teen something. I just act like, this is how everybody acts. We all use this slang and we all talk like this. No, you're going higher. Forget silliness, gentlemen. Forget silliness. We're setting examples here for the believers. The second thing he says in 1 Timothy 4.12 is set for the believers an example in your conduct. And here, this is where Peter says, as he who called you is holy, you also shall be holy in all your conduct. The desire for the Christian is to be like Christ. Do you realize that's what sanctification means? To be like Christ? 2 Corinthians 3.18 We all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. This comes from the Spirit, who is the Lord. Sanctification, as you grow as a Christian in holiness, it's very simply becoming more like Jesus. Okay? And so in our conduct, we're seeking to act the way Christ acted. So you're not saying, again, well, I'm just this kind of, I'm just a kid, I can do... No, you're saying, how can I act in a holy way? Now, I'm not saying don't be your age. I'm not saying, you know, you can't enjoy things that teenagers enjoy or you can't be in high school. That's what I'm saying. I'm not saying you got to go read a dictionary on Friday night, okay? But what I'm saying is, in your conduct, are you pursuing holiness? Are you pursuing purity? Are you pursuing, we'll look at that in a moment, are you pursuing Christ-likeness? You're to set an example in these things. For the sake of time, we're going to run through this. The next thing is love. He says, set for the believers an example in love. Let me give you a little theology of love very quickly. There are four forms of love in the Greek language, okay? We have storge. Storge is an affectionate type of love, the type of love that you have for mom because she's your mom, 
That's storge love, okay? We have eros. Eros is passionate or a sexual love. It's love between a husband and a wife. Phileo refers to brotherly love. It's kind of the companionship. So some of you guys here who are bros, here's the Greek term for that, phileo love, okay? You learned something new. Yeah. Now agape is the fourth kind of love. You know what kind of love this is? Self-sacrificial. What's your name? Zach. Zach said self-sacrificial love. In the New Testament, when we see the love of God being displayed, it's agape love. Now I want you to listen to this. This is powerful. 1 John 4, 9. Watch this. In this, in this, the love of God was made manifest among us that God sent His only Son into the world so that we might live through Him. What he's saying is this. You want to see agape love? It's, it's, it's ultimate display is in the fact that Jesus Christ gave up heaven and the joys of it to come to this earth, to be brutally treated, spit upon, mocked, not to have a place to lay his head, though he's the king of the universe, and to ultimately be killed and crushed for the wickedness that you and I have done. You want a definition of love? Behold Jesus Christ on the cross. There's no act more sacrificial than that, is there? And what Paul says to Timothy is, guys, be an example of this kind of love. Agape love. Selfless love. Sacrificial love. Not where you just love one another because of what you get from one another, but you love one another for the good of the other. You lay down your life to love and serve the body. And he's saying, let the church, let the pastor look at you, young man, and go, yes, I want to love like he does. Agape love like Christ. Faith. He says, set for the believers an example in faith. This is the word pistis in Scripture. Pistis means entrustment. Casting yourself upon something. It's the conviction of truth. I'm going to have to... Oh, we got time. We're going to go through this. Do we have time, Zeke? Okay. Set for the believers an example of faith. I want to talk to you something about very quickly. Um, there's something in Scripture that you could call the doctrine of deception. You know what deception is, right? You believe one thing, but it's false. You were deceived. There's a doctrine of deception in Scripture in regards to faith. Faith. Now, we're saved by faith, right? Salvation is by faith in Christ. But I want to tell you something. There is a doctrine of deception in regards to faith. Now, what I say right now, if any of you feel like you may be deceived when it comes to your faith, I'm going to stick around. I'm going to stay here. And I have Zeke's permission that when you go to your small groups, if you want to talk about what I'm about to talk about, if you want to talk about it more, I'm going to stay here and talk with you guys about it, okay? So what I'm about to say, but it's this. There is a doctrine of deception in the Bible when it comes to faith. I'm going to give you some examples very quickly. John chapter 2. Crowds of people like you, but thousands more, were following Jesus and they saw everything he did. Miracles. They listen to him teach. And they come to Jesus and the crowd says, Jesus, we believe in you. We have faith in you. You know what Jesus says to them? He doesn't go, great, give me some tithe. He looks at him and goes, but I don't believe in you. And it says, because he knew what was in their heart. They had faith because they could get what they wanted from Jesus. Yeah. Wine at a wedding? Whew. Believe in this guy. Simon the Magician, Acts chapter 8. Philip comes to Samaria and preaches, and it says, Simon believed, was baptized, and continued in the teaching. He was a front row Christian. About five or six verses later, Peter comes to Samaria, and through a series of events, he's talking with Simon, and you know what he says to Simon? May your money go to hell with you. You have no part or lot in this matter. Repent. If possible, you can be forgiven. 
Simon was headed for hell, but he believed. And Peter says, you don't have a right belief. Here's a scary one. James chapter 2. And I'm going to ask you, do you guys believe in God? Do you believe that he's one? That's good, right? Even the demons believe and they tremble. It's James chapter 2, verse 19. The demons have dwelt in heaven. You don't think they believe in God when Jesus Christ walked up to them and they shook in their boots and said, what do you have to do with us? You don't think they believed in Jesus? They knew who he was. In fact, they begged Jesus not to send them out from the Gadarean man. And Jesus said, go. And they had to go. They believed and they're, they're in chains of torment in hell reserved for them. Guys, there is a belief. There is a pistis. There is a faith which is a demonic faith. So my question to you is, how do you know you truly believe? In Matthew chapter 7, on the great day of judgment, Jesus Christ says to the crowds who come to Him, and they say, Oh Lord, Lord, we did many mighty works in Your name. We cast out devils in Your name. Lord, Lord. And Jesus says to them, Depart from Me. I never knew you. You workers of lawlessness. There's a doctrine of deception where people believe, but they have a demonic lack or a demonic unsaving belief. Gentlemen, we can talk more about that after if you want. Paul is saying to you, Christian man, set for the believers an example of faith, of belief in this sense. You must be a Christian man of deep conviction these faith these these truths about christ are not to only be mental truths and facts to you that you check off and say yeah i believe that no the truths about christ are to grip you in such a way that they change your life that they change how you live they change how you eat they change how you go to school. They change how you treat women. They change how you talk to mom and dad. Your faith in Christ changes you. He says, be an example of that. Do you simply believe with your mind or have you been gripped by the truths of Christ? Look in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 4. He says, are we in 1 Thessalonians 1, verse 4? There we are. For we know, brothers, loved by God, that He has chosen you because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. This was a faith that the men... Notice this. I'm going to say it this way and this might stick with you. True faith is not a, a, a belief you hold in your hand. It's a belief that holds you in its grip. It's a faith that changes you. It comes with power into your life and conviction and it radically disrupts the very core of who you are. It's not something you hang on your keychain and say, yeah, Jesus got that. When I was seven years old, I prayed a prayer. Look, wait, got it. Look at that. Wrote it in my Bible. It's not belief. Belief radically disrupts the very center of who you are and changes you. And Paul looks at the Thessalonians and says, Brothers, we know God has chosen you because when we preach the gospel, it came with power. Look in verse 8. For not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere. Notice this. Your faith has gone everywhere. Notice that. Everybody's heard about their faith. Why? Verse 9, for they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. Their faith was evidenced in the fact that they stopped serving idols and began actively serving God. Do you see that? True faith produces something. It changes you. It takes possession of you and it rules your thinking. Guys, this is the kind of faith that sets someone on fire. This is the kind of faith that turns you into a Peter in Acts 4. You know what Peter did in Acts 4? Listen to this. This is Acts 4, 19. Peter and John answered them. They'd gone before the council literally being beaten because they were preaching the gospel, being beaten, and they were said, don't you preach this gospel. And this is their response. 
Watch this, guys. Um, I see some pretty big guys here that I wouldn't want to rumble with, right? And imagine a bunch of hooligans pick you up and they pound you. In fact, I think Peter and John Axe Court were whipped. I'm not sure. Don't quote me on that. I have to check the context. But they were beaten, dragged before the Sanhedrin, and they were told, stop it. You better stop talking about Jesus. And so they went, oh, okay, so, okay, wow, not, let's not do that again. Is that how they responded? No, because they believed something, remember? They were gripped by it. They couldn't just put this faith down. If you hold something intellectually only, you can pick it up and put it down, right? That's why some of you, when you come to church, you pick up your faith and you act like a Christian. And then you go on Monday to school and you put it down. Yeah, I'll pick it up, I'll put it down. I'll pick it up, put it down. It's not saving faith. Saving faith grips you. So notice what they said. Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather to, than to God, you must judge, for we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. We don't have a choice in the matter. I've got to preach Christ. That's faith, gentlemen. This kind of conviction when the truths you believe take possession of your heart and mind is what creates a Christian man. Conviction is what drives you to speak with boldness of lion in the face of evil. This kind of conviction is what burns in the Christian leader's bones where they cannot help but declare to a world starving for substance and meaning the truth of Christ. This is the kind of conviction that motivates action no matter the opposition threats, or consequences. This is the kind of conviction of Stephen. Oh, I love Stephen in Acts chapter 7. Get to know Stephen. He's an ordinary dude. In the church, you know who Stephen was? The widows weren't getting served lunch. The widows, okay? And so people go to the apostles and they say, guys, the widows are missing out on lunch. And so the apostles say, look, we've got to preach and we've got to pray. So you pick amongst yourselves men who can serve the widows. And they pick Stephen. He was one of them. He's just serving widow's lunch at meal. He's just a normal guy in the church. He's setting up the chairs. He's just a normal guy. Filled with the Holy Spirit. And you know what happened to Stephen? He's the first Christian martyr ever. Guys, if you don't know this story, you've got, you got to love it. It sends chills up my spine. You, Stephen stands before a massive crowd and he begins to preach Jesus Christ is the Messiah. Just a normal guy. And he's preaching Christ as the Messiah. And the crowd doesn't go, yeah, decisions for Christ. I want, yeah, I want to be a decision for Christ. You know what the crowd does? It says they gnashed their teeth. And they rushed him. And they dragged him into the street. And they picked up stones and began stoning him to death. And they killed him. And you know what he prayed as they killed him? Father, do not hold this against them. Forgive them. The same thing Jesus prayed on the cross. And it says Christ was standing at the right hand of God as Stephen was being stoned. Christ was ready to receive his boy. I love Stephen, but guess what? Even when rocks were going to crush his skull, he preached truth. Why? Because he believed it. It had gripped him. He didn't say, oh, you know what? I'll put my Christianity down for a little bit. This isn't going to go well for me. Guys, the reality of the gospel controlled and possessed his heart and mind and soul. He could not help but declare it. Be an example of faith. The last one is this, and, and we're over our time. I'm so sorry. But the last one is purity. I've got to say something about purity. Guys, be an example of purity. You're told in the book of First and Second Timothy and Titus, that you as young men are to treat the young women in the faith as sisters. So, if your biological, physical sister is not going to get weird, perverted, sexual feelings from you, then neither should the women in this church. Okay? Purity. And I want to say this. I, I'm going to end here. And there's so much more. I, I could go more here, but... Sexual purity in Revelation 2.24, or sexual sin, I'm sorry, is referred to in Revelation 2.24. You can check it. It's not up on the screen. It's called the deep things of Satan. The deep things of Satan. So, when Satan really wants to pull a man down, he goes to sexual sin. 
You could say, you know, as they said about David, do you remember David and Saul? They saw, Saul has slain his thousands, David his ten thousands. You guys remember that? Yes. Sin slays its thousands. Sexual sin, it's ten thousands. Sexual sin, the deep things of Satan. And guys, it's designed to trip you up. It's the battle we're in. And I just want to say this. I'm going to say four things and I'm done. Be open with godly brothers about your struggles with sexual lust. Be open. Uncover it. Don't let it stay hidden. Don't let it stay hidden. Because Satan's been doing this for thousands of years. And if you say, I got this with me and Jesus, don't believe it. Open up to Zeke, to Ken. Open up to these guys and say, help me. Call me. I just gave a couple guys my email and my number. I said, if you ever need to call someone, I'm far, five hours away. I'm far enough away not to be a threat to you, okay? I'm five hours away on the border of Mexico. Call me and talk to me. Open up about your lust. And I'm not even going to ask you if you're struggling. I'm going to say because you're struggling. In the way you're struggling. Guys, it's not even a question anymore if you're wrestling with this stuff. It's a given. Be open about it. The second thing I want to say is this. Flee pornography as if it is the plague. Do not mess around with images on the internet. Run as if your life depends on it because your soul's life does. The other thing is this. Be motivated by the fear of God. God says no sexually immoral person will ever enter heaven. When you go to click, don't forget God. Satan doesn't, when you're tempted with sexual sin, Satan doesn't tempt you with blasphemous thoughts of God. He doesn't. You don't start thinking blasphemous thoughts of God. You realize that? You're not going to start thinking um, non-Trinitarian doctrine. You're not going to start believing doctrinal lies and theological misnomers. You're not going to, none of that. You know what he's going to tempt you with? Forgetfulness of God. In that moment of temptation, you're going to forget about God. Fear God. The fear of God before your eyes. The fourth thing and the final thing is what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5.14, the love of Christ controls us. Guys, when you pursue sexual lust and sexual sin, you separate the intimacy with you and your Savior. And the love of Christ controls us because Christ died for that sin that we say like Joseph, how could I do this great sin against my God? So guys, I'm going to just close. But... Be an example. Set for the believers an example. Don't sit in this mode and say, well, I'm just a young teen. No, pursue godliness, not silly myths. Okay? Love you guys. Father, please help us to live these truths. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.